What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Sheehan Show here on Sherdog.com. My name is Sean Sheehan, as always, and I am joined today by the number one man covering Irish MMA, European MMA, worldwide MMA as well, I suppose. Ian O'Neill coming to you all the way from beautiful Canada, but by via the beautiful uh, county of Kilkenny. And Ian is joining me today because... I wanted to kind of check in, you know, myself and Ian do a, a podcast over on uh, Severe May called The Chasing Pack, and I kind of wanted to do a, a European, maybe mini chasing pack here, because we've had a lot of talk of minds over the last few months, especially, about how people are kind of brought up in Europe now, how fighters are brought up in Europe, how the fighters from Europe get to the UFC, and we've reached a stage now where we're at a very interesting point about what moves fighters make when they move them and I suppose where they uh, where they make them to and uh, I'm delighted to have you t- today Ian, to, to join all of that but before we get into all of it the scene here right especially look especially in Ireland but I, I feel like in Europe in general in the UK it see it feels like it's really buzzing at the moment you know with the, all the cage warrior champions which we will talk a lot about in a second but you know the Italian scene buzzing for, uh, you know, a Bellator in 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 Paris, the UFC coming to all the, the different places or have over the last while, you know, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. It just feels like it's been a really great time for European MMA on the kind of the the the, the mid scale, if you want to put it that way. Like the, the 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 fighters coming up, the cards coming up. Obviously, we need another McGregor or another Bisping or something like that. But you need this first, don't you? As someone who covers the scene a lot. I, am I being a bit positive there, or do you see it the same way? Do you do, uh, look? Because I think it's very, very good at the moment. Overall, in Europe, I don't remember a time where it's been better, to be honest, than it is right now. In terms of options, in terms of shows that are being put on, in terms of traction, like you know, we're talking maybe about uh, more on the regional scene. There can be always an can't always be always enough shows that are going on on the regional scene but like in the terms of the big shows that we've had in in ireland and even when you look at the ufc we're regularly coming back to london now as well so obviously they're seeing some of the fruits of the labor of of mixed martial arts in europe as well whereas that we have different kind of options for fighters coming up especially in ireland and in the uk as well where you know there wasn't really a path to the Bellator or a path to PFL. Um, a lot of people, and I know we'll talk about Cage Warriors as well, chose Cage Warriors as the route to get to the UFC as well. But, you know, um, a lot of talk really is that now it might not suit everybody to go to the UFC. And, and, and that's true as well in terms of what you want in your career. Um, the path you see yourself going down is going to depend truly to what you want it set yourself as a fighter. Um, but I mean, to have the luxury of the choice now, it, I, I have to say it's never been as as open as it is right now in terms of choice for fighters and what path they go down. A hundred percent. And that's kind of the crux, I think, of this podcast. I wanted, wanted to get you on to talk about it. And let's take maybe each individual choice uh, as they go. And let's, you mentioned cage warriors, so let's go with them first. And I feel like the general talk about cage warriors over the last while has been, is cage warriors still as good of a stepping stone to the UFC as it once was, right? And it's interesting because if you look over, say, the last the last batch of cage warriors fighters, uh, Paddy Pimblett got to the UFC, Ian Gary got to the UFC, the likes of Nathaniel Wood, the likes of Jack Shore, the likes of Mason Jones, they all did get to the UFC, right? At the moment, there does seem to be a bit of, I don't know, is backlog the word, or a bit of a, a, a longer time to actually get there. The likes of Paul Hughes has been waiting for a while, and he doesn't want to wait. George Harduk has been waiting for a while, he did, does want to wait, though, according to his manager, Graham Boylan, who obviously spoke about, uh, spoke to on this channel not too long ago. And then, you know, we have Reese McKee, who, you know, won his title fight only a couple of weeks ago, so maybe even by the time this comes out, hopefully he'll be signed. And then the likes of Kayla Nockran as well. But those lads that felt like maybe three years ago would nearly have already been signed. And I wonder, and I'll throw this over to you and I'll get your take on because I might give my take too. Is this a case of they're not signing those guys anymore and maybe we can get into the reasons for that 
Or is it a case of it's just going to take a little bit longer and maybe even a fight longer for lads like that to get signed? What's your take on it? I think since the introduction of Dana White's Contender Series, we've seen a little bit of a shift in who's getting signed to the UFC because down through the year, Shawnee, we would have seen it time and time again. You're talking about performances, and we'll go way back to Paul Hughes' performance against Jordan Vucenic. Um, that performance would have immediately got you signed into the UFC. I think even Reese McKee's latest performances and his finishes would have got him immediately signed to the UFC and even signed back. Look, at Reese did get his opportunity. He wants to go back there. He deserves to go back there again. But, you know, the work that he's put in over the last course, uh, uh, three fights since he's got um, released from the UFC is is UFC worthy based on previous kind of signings as well. Same with Caelan Lochran going out there and dismantling an, an undefeated prospect uh, in Dylan Hazan. It would have, we would have been talking, oh, straight to the UFC there. But it's simply not happening. And I think the first time it really kind of, it kind of like, I noticed it was maybe for Paul Hughes um, because, you know, we know Paul Hughes is good enough to get to the UFC and he deserves it. With Dana White's Contender Series, we're getting prospects from not only Europe, but from all over the world that are coming in. That slot is only a 10-week slot that you'll get in and you'll have only those opportunities to kind of sign. And unless you're willing to come in at short notice, the UFC aren't signing too many people outside of North America um, to, to to kind of go there unless you want to take a fight on two or three weeks notice or you're on a wait list. So I would say the big change has been that of the Dana White Contender Series. Now, we even have seen some Cage Warriors fighters go over there and compete. Your, your Jake Hadley's, uh, Justin Burlinson went over there and competed as well. We have Tobias Aurelia who's going over there. And you know what? Credit to them, those guys as well. But like there's a couple of fighters that we'll see compete on the Dana White's Contender Series that would have been signed straight up to the UFC five years ago based on the talent that they have. And that simply isn't happening right now. So we are kind of caught in this crossroads where, you know, fighters are good enough to get to the UFC. They're not getting signed and maybe their hand is getting a little bit forced in maybe taking these short notice fights too, which is not always ideal and doesn't really work out for everybody either. So I think... It's something I've been thinking about what has been the kind of the what's been stopping the progress of fighters getting signed over from Europe. And I do definitely think it is the introduction of Dana White's contender series. It is without a shadow of a doubt because, and it's the single biggest reason. I'm glad you're hitting it because that was a point I was going to hit on too. And the reason is, is pretty simple because you look at if you're Sean Shelby, Mick Maynard, right? And you you can't sign a hundred fighters, or you know, you have a you have an amount of fighters you can sign. Maybe you have to release a few ones. You can't sign as many fighters as you want, but you have to find sign fighters from Dana White Contender Series. You have no option because Dana White comes at the end of the card and goes, "You have to sign these four lads." Well, Sean Shelby and Mick Maynard could have been looking at three of their opponents trying to set them up to get him into the UFC. They end up losing by a madness. It can happen. The Dana White Contender Series is a very weird sort of thing where we see it. You know, it does weird things to people, and that's its design, which is grand. But it also leaves them with loads of fighters they don't want, and let's say they do want Paul Hughes or whoever it might be they don't end up signing them because they have to sign the other guys in the Dana White Contender Series. So, <laughs> look, it's it's a situation, again, like the UFC in a lot of different ways have uh, found themselves in. And it was funny, someone, <laughs> you know, someone threw this gotcha tweet at me the other day, and I thought it was actually very funny because it was like the exact opposite of a gotcha tweet because they said to me, like, you've been given out about the UFC's cards for the last while and their undercards, Yet, you come out here and you praise Cage Warriors, their feeder lead, league. And I was thinking to myself, it's one of those ones like, you haven't thought for two seconds, so I'm not even going to reply. But here I am on the show talking about it, so in the end, who's the winner? You. Uh, if they signed the guys in Cage Warriors who have proven that they can beat other good guys in good matchmaking and they go into the UFC, that's the sort of fighter that will make the UFC undercards, middle cards, and main card's better in the next two to five years or whatever it might be. When Christian Leroy Duncan comes in and gets signed, it's exciting. I mentioned it, say, on, on the podcast here, I mentioned it with John Anik, you mentioned it on one of your podcasts and said it as well, and people are thinking about it, talking about it. Next thing he comes in, okay, the fight, his fight went a bit weird, obviously, but the next fight where he fights, it's going to it's gonna be a big thing. The same with, look at Ian Gary. 
look at Paddy Bimble, look at all these guys. And whether they win or lose, it it's you know, that's that's a different point as well. But when you build guys like that, it builds anticipation. It builds people caring about them. And what we have from the Kinder series is a guy maybe you'll see once for 90 seconds or for, you know, maybe 15 minutes, but a, a person who lots of people are not actually seeing at all, they get signed off the back of one fight, maybe one punch, maybe one minute, and they're in the Contender series. Whereas if you look at people who've watched, let's say, Cage Warriors, but that doesn't have to be Cage Warriors. Let's say they've watched Roberto Soldic and he had been signed. No, okay, it hasn't gone great for him and one championship either, but you get what I mean. Like someone like that, AJ McKee, a better example, maybe. They sign AJ McKee, they sign Kaelin Lockhart, they sign, you know, uh, Paul Hughes, whoever it might be. There's that excitement built because people have watched four or five fights of them. They get signed, they see a fight. They, uh, you know, maybe someone in the know tweets it, yourself or myself or, you know, whoever the covering the European scene says, this guy is a guy to watch. And they go and watch him. Whereas we very rarely see that with guys at the moment. Like, I think there's a guy recently, Cameron Simon. I think uh, a few people talked about him and he had, did an interview. I was like, okay, I might watch him. And then you watch him. He's like, okay, that guy's not bad. Not bad. And it's happened for a few other guys. Like, maybe a teammate of, say, someone like in Israel Adesanya. Or a team, maybe, you know, back in the day, a teammate of McGregor or whatever. It did it like that. But it seems like more and more now, you put on a UFC card and you see a lot of guys you don't know with a lot, you know, a few guys at the top who you do know. Whereas if you build them through a cage wearers or a, a company like that, a promotion like that, when they come to the UFC, they, they are already tailor-made bigger stars than the ones on the undercard. And I think that's fairly self-evident as to, and we've obviously a little bit of European bias here, but I think, I, I actually, I think that is pretty much the case based on how American people look at them too. So when we look at cage warriors, we are looking at a very good base for it. They also, you know, they're fighting the octagon. They're, you know, you know, they're fighting UFC fight pass. They're used to it as well. So I still think it is a great base. But that changes if this kind of postponement of signings goes on. Let's say Paul Hughes doesn't get signed and is forced to go con- through contender series or Kane and Lockhart is forced to have three more fights or Reese McKee. Like if Reese McKee is forced to have one more fight, I think that's a, a bad enough sign to be honest. Like he should be signed right now. He went out, he got three, three fights, three finishes, won a title, defended it. A guy like that is is dead on should be signed. He should never have been dropped by the UFC. So I think it's a very interesting time. Like the people call Cage Warriors the feeder league, and I think it's a compliment. Some people take take that as a negative, but if it turns into something that's not the feeder league, or a feeder league that w- isn't as efficient as it once was, then there might be a, a slight issue there. But what way do you think it's going to go? And uh, give me your opinions on that first of all as well. But what way do you think it's going to go? Like, do you, do you think that could happen and that could have a big negative effect on Cage Warriors if it was to go like that? No, I don't necessarily think it is, but it's an interesting time for Cage Warriors, isn't it? Well, like that's what Cage Warriors markets themselves as, as the feeder league. They're not ashamed of that at all. Like that's what Graham Boylan has come out and talked to you about and has stated, look at the structure of Cage Warriors is to number one, build you as a fighter early in your professional career with the correct matchups at the correct time under the same scenario or different scenarios and circumstances. And I think for many, many years, Cage Warriors and Ian Dean in particular has done a fantastic job in doing that. But the problem that they now have is that what you are saying you are is not truly happening or is not happening as much as it used to in the amount of signings that they are being picked up from Cage Warriors or, you know, are fighters going to want to go down that route if there is no guarantee for the UFC? If you're going to have to fight for a title three times and defend it and then wait for six months, I mean, it, to me, it's a travesty Paul Hughes hasn't been signed yet. Uh, Paul Hughes is on the sidelines waiting for something to happen. And when you're on the sidelines, Sean, you're not earning any money. You know what I mean? And you can't be doing that as a fighter either. You've got to make ends meet every now and again. I think another major factor in this, which I hope will improve, is the lack of UFC European shows right now. We're only going to London. We've not travelled to Ireland in many years. When is the last time that we've had one on, on, on mainland Europe? They had one in Paris last year. Well, I remember a time in the UFC calendar where you were at least getting five or six European show fight night cards. The fight night cards are now happening in the UFC apex. They're not happening in Europe anymore. And I think that's a major, major factor as well. That's a good point. And I hadn't really thought of that. A major factor in like the fighters not getting signed. You know, it, it, 
it, it is. It absolutely is. It's a lot easier to fly someone from Ireland to Paris, and you know, than it is from Ireland to, to Vegas or whatever. It's a it's a very interesting point, and uh, you know, we look at it more holistically again because like. There's other options for fighters. And this, look, this has been a big talk of mine. You can take the option of cage warriors, right? And you get two positives out of it, right? You win all your fights or you win a good share of your fights and you might or very well could get signed to the UFC. And the other big positive out of it is that you will be match made well. And if you stay there long enough, your level will improve with that matchmaking. If you have a good... Uh, work ethic if you're a good fighter if you have a good gym behind you a good coach and all of that you will get great matchmaker from Ian Dean in a promotion which will build you right there's no doubt about that the the bad side of it and Graham Bynum fully admitted this in the interview with me is you're not going to get paid a lot right you're not going to get paid a lot Um, but you can in other places now I feel like there's been this this drama lately, and it's always kind of been there, I suppose, between Bellator and uh, Cage Warriors, but now between PFL and Cage Warriors as well, about, you know, <laughs> one side says, oh, these lads uh, are, uh, you know, are just taking the money and they have no interest in being the best fighter in the world. And the other side says, oh, this, uh, all these fighters have been sold to dream so these people can make money off them. And, you know, there a few of them will get to the UFC, but the vast majority of them won't, right? <sighs> I think it's great to have options as a fighter. If you want to be a fighter and, and, and your option is to go and fight and say, look, I want to get to the UFC. I don't care how much money I earn. Absolutely, you should be able to do that. If your fighter says, I want to get paid at least 10 grand per fight or whatever, and you won't go to cage wires, your prerogative is to do that. I think that's a positive. And a lot of people looking at that as a negative is a very weird thing to me. So we're not even going to talk about that, to be honest, because I have no interest in talking about that. But let's talk about the positives, say for the, not, not even the positives, but the, the uh, integers that decide the European fighters' development in, Bellat- in either Bellator or PFL. Now, we haven't seen, well, we've seen one or two, one, I think, PFL card so far, and we've seen, obviously, a lot of Bellator cards. And as you said there, the UFC aren't coming much to, um, uh, to this region, but the, uh, you know, Bellator have. So, um, uh, it's it's been a great time for European fighters in Bellator because they have been able to get those fights a lot. Even, say, you know, lads who are maybe Irish, they miss out on an Irish card. And a few weeks later, there, there was, you know, there was Russian card. There might be an Italian card. Or, you know, we've seen a lot of that. So it's been a great time for them. Uh, I feel like it's a very interesting time with Bellator. And we, we look... Is Bellator even going to exist anymore after another few weeks or a few months? We just don't know. Like, there's these rumors of it being up for sale. If it if it is, are they going to continue on like a European series? Now, the European series didn't go great for Bellator, right? The Irish series went very well for Bellator and a few more of the, the places they went to. But, like, you don't really see them going to the UK anymore, you know? Uh, the UK didn't go great for them. But in general, I think they have been smart about where they're going and what they're doing there. And it's been great for a lot of the fighters in terms of the ability to earn money. Now, it's not been amazing for a lot of the fighters in terms of where they've gone and where the, the jeopardy they've done. But the option... Just about the option, Ian. Like, the option to have Bellator, the option to go that route is something that fighters just did not have in in Europe a long time ago. And it's not just Ireland either. Like, we've seen a lot of guys... You know, I mentioned George, George Hardwick there in Cage Wars. He fought in Bellator, you know, before he fought, he fought Richard Kiley, didn't he? And, he? and he did a couple of fights there. Lots of lads, you know, Jimmy Wallet a few weeks ago, fought in Bellator and in Cage Wars. Lewis Long and loads of more people from Ireland and abroad. You know, we see the likes of Kane Moussa last week, Thibaut Guti... You know, uh, Fabian Edwards, who you know, uh, who who fought uh, last weekend, and Gegard Musasi and all. It's been a, a massive opportunity for a, a lot of those guys to earn a lot of money as well, even though they're not going to go the UFC route. There are positives in that too, aren't there? Because like sometimes we look at the sport, and we have down through the years, and it's been a UFC centric sport. And I feel like we can't look at it that way anymore. We have to look at these lads are you know, if you take the option to earn the money for your family and go that route i find it very hard to criticize that ian like and and i i think anyone that does has been a little bit foolhardy fair enough if your option is to go the other way but i think there's a genuine option to go that way too isn't there yeah like we can't really fall into the trap of 
wanting to see fighters where we want to see them. You know what I mean? They're going to be the ones who know what knows what what's best for them in their current situation. Um not having an option of Bellator and PFL, like even with Bellator, the options are limited, but we have Bellator, we have PFL, we have KSW, we have Octagon on the scene over there. We have Aries fighting championships. There is plenty of different avenues. And, you know, depending on what you want there in your career, it's more important to have these shows as well to get used to kind of these big shows, especially in a region like Ireland where, we don't really have as much regional shows as we should, obviously, because the sport of, of mixed martial arts isn't regulated or recognized in Ireland. So it's a lot harder to put on those shows. So even the value of having those big shows in Ireland is so, so much beneficial, maybe more so than a lot of other places where the sport is regulated because it gives the fighters opportunities to fight. And if you were just kind of based in your professional experience of fighting on regional shows and then maybe hoping to get from there onto Cage Warriors and then from Cage Warriors onto the UFC because that was the standard role of procedure really back in the day. Well, it's so much nicer and it must feel a lot better for these fighters now to kind of come in and have a choice to go with Bellator or have a choice to go with PFL where they have a chance to go and win like a million in a tournament as well. So they can not alone get the experience but they can also get uh, there's a financial benefit for them in, in joining up with these kind of shows as well. And there, there actually is, and I I think it's very interesting as well because right, you signed for a Bellator, you signed for a PFL, and you 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 go or uh, yeah, or the, the two of those, and you signed for maybe a certain amount of fights, a certain amount of money, or a certain amount of time, and you come to the end of that right, and you find yourself in a good position if you have done well. Let's say you sign a six fight contract or a two year contract or whatever, and you end up after that period and you're, you know, six and off, five and off, seven or whatever it might be. Well, you're in a situation there where, whether, you know, maybe they can match your contract, but they're going to have to give you a good amount of money to keep you or otherwise, you know, the UFC might actually want to sign you because you're coming out of those, that organization with a pretty good record. Now, we haven't really seen that yet, to be honest, because I think a lot of people, when they get there, they don't want to give up the money because they know the UFC are going to only sign them either to Dana White Contender Series or sign them for 10 and 10, 12 and 12. And we've seen a lot of guys who have actually lost in Dana White Contender Series end up in PFL, end up in um, cage wars, and actually being good fighters and doing pretty well. So it's, yeah. the, the thing about that is options, really, isn't it? I like these options are it all is. very, very good. I like, you have to, hmm. you have to really assess your situation, like, and understand that you're going to take a, a make a big sacrifice and take a big hit so it's you're you're based on the risk and reward, and the risk is that you know for t- guys like Mateus Gamra who went over there and took a massive pay cut from yes. KSW, he took a big big risk. A guy like Paddy Pimblett who turned down the UFC time and time again, and who definitely took a pay cut based off his last um, contract on Cage Warriors, where I, he seemingly was getting paid quite well, but he took a he took that gamble over to the UFC, but that gamble has paid off for both of those guys. You see Gamera, he's competing in the top 10 of the UFC. He's becoming a household name in North America now as well. The same as Paddy Pimler, who is blown up, who's a huge superstar right now, signed the Barstool deal. But the fact of the matter is, is that that's not going to happen to every single fighter that signs with the UFC right now. So it's such and such important conversation to have with yourself as a fighter and also with your team and your management as well, who need to have the best kind of outcome for you uh, and deal with it in a, in a reality-based situation as well. That's it, isn't it? Plus, um, the, yeah. The reality, it's like, a lot it, of people don't live in reality, do they? <laughs> no, no. In the fight game, they definitely no. don't. They <laughs> definitely don't. But it's also who you're going to tie yourself in with as well. Because I, I would, I would label Bellator and PFL as quite good for terms of being fighter friendly when it comes to matchups and stuff like that, where you're going to get match friendly. Whereas that we have... Uh, forgive me for naming and shaming, maybe Brave Championships or, or Combate Global who are, you know, Brave are set over in the Middle East and they're going to target their Middle East audience. You have Combate Global who is set and, and going to kind of feed into their Latino-based audience, right? So are they going to want to, I, I, although we have had fighters signed there, are they going to want an Irish fighter in their organization to come and, and work their way to the top? Or are they going to try and build their fighters off of a guy from Ireland who is going to come in and be a good fighter? But, you know, 
they will want Combat Your Global want a Latino champion the same as Brave CF wants maybe a, a, a champion that's based over in the Middle East or Asia or somewhere like that um, similar enough to maybe one championships for, per se but with their introduction into the States we have seen an influx of American based fighters there as well but you know I think where their markets are is where they should be trying to promote their fighters. And, you know, you can't blame them for that, but it's a conversation that you need to have with yourself before you tie in with an organization. Absolutely. Because the thing about it is, right, if you think about it, right, let's go through every single organization. Now, we kind of just named her. So, uh, Cage Warriors, Christian Eri Duncan has signed out of Cage Warriors in the last few months. Brave. Sam Patterson went to the UFC from Brave in, 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 the, last, uh, in the last few months. The Dana White Contender Series. Chris, uh, Chris Duncan went through the Dana White, Cont- uh, Dana White Contender Series in the last one. You can go on. A name like uh, Octagon wasn't Lucy Pudelova and Octagon and went through there. Tough. Lee Hammond isn't tough. We hope he will be, you know, in, in the UFC when that ends. Look at Kiefer Crosby. He fought in the regional scene out in uh, out in Portugal, wasn't it? And look, yeah. hopefully he'll be signed to the UFC as well. So if you look at it right... There are, are so many options of actually moving, whether you want to move to UFC, whether you want to move to Bellator or PFL, of getting there, right? Which is the best case scenario. But as you said there, not only which is the right option to get you there, but where is the right option to go? Because like, I, I it's because Paddy Pim, that's a funny one, right? Because I think if he had gone to Bellator, they would have paid him a lot of money. And I, funnily enough, think he probably would have done better in Bellator in terms of su- success in the cage than he eventually will in the UFC. And like, what happens when he eventually does start losing in the UFC? And I, look, I, everyone knows my thoughts on Paddy. I don't think that'll be too far away. No disrespect to Paddy or, or anything. I just think the level of fighter in the UFC is very, very, very good. And he's, he's going to struggle when he gets there. But the Bellator... As you said, with the matchmaking, if it can be a bit more favourable, if they realise this guy is their star, and they could have moved him that way. And now, it's worked out brilliantly. He's got a million pound deal with Barstool and all. So, you know, throw my cods well up, up in the air. He made the right decision. But there's certain fighters, right, they make the decision to go to the UFC, and they're going to be a 10 and 10, 12 and 12, 14 and 14, 16 and 16 fighter. And if they go one and three, they're gonzo. They're gone, right? And you could go to Bellator and you could sign a 5 fi contract and get a lot more money and maybe you're not gone or maybe you are gone and you have earned a lot more money. But also then, I was speaking to someone rest, uh, recently and they were saying to me like, you know, <laughs> and I don't want, maybe I shouldn't go into too much specifics, but they're saying like, you go to Bellator, right? And you have, let's say, five fights in Bellator. You might earn 150 grand. By the time you take taxes out of that, by the time you take your team money out of that, you're probably looking at 50 grand over three or four years. Like, that's not big money anyway. So why would you not just try to go to the UFC? So it's a very, it's a very tough situation. And like, this podcast was set out to do exactly what I just did there. Give you no solutions. Because there isn't an actual real solution to this. And that's the biggest crux of like the whole people giving out and people like, oh, taking sides and all. We don't want this to turn into American politics or Irish politics or Man United versus Liverpool or whatever. We need to look at this from a point of view that the more options, the better. The, the worst thing that MMA could be is a monopoly. And, you know, people have argued. We had that, that already. We <laughs> yeah. had that already. Let's be, let's be real. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, there was the likes of strike forces and the afflictions and, and the pride fighting championships. You know, we, we're coming back to a stage right now where there are more prominent mixed martial arts organizations out there as a whole than there ever has been before. And, I'm not sure that the UFC is still modeling under the same business model as they were just basically what they did in the past was just buy up their opposition, acquire their talent, and then that's how they monopolize the sport. And that's basically how they are as big as they are today. But I think that the UFC are gone so big right now and they're financially super secure and have run a proper good business model there to generate money. Whereas that, you know, they are maybe slipping a little bit and it's given these other organizations a little bit more of a leeway to kind of sign better fighters uh, and to know to, to kind of build those fighters up into to to actual genuine competitors in regards to who's going to be who on the MMA sphere. I think now more so than ever, there can be a big argument as to who is the best champion out there. Uh, the, back in the day, it was always like, if you're a UFC champion, you're, you're the best in the world, but that isn't necessarily the case right now. That kind of pendulum is shifting. And I think it's going to continue to shift over the course of the next three, four, five years 
and I'm very interested to see where it lands. And I think I'm not saying that as a negative thing. I think that's going to have a very positive impact on the on the whole sport of mixed martial arts. And I, I think the next time I get you back on, I think that's the discussion we'll probably have because there's a very interesting discussion to be had on that. But maybe to, to kind of close this out, I said earlier, like, you know, there's rumours of Bellator being sold and they mightn't be around in the same guise as they, you know, they are now in, in a year or in two months or in five years. That'd be terrible. It would be terrible. I hope Bellator stick around. I hope PFL keep putting on the cards like the, you know, the European series. Like I hope that lasts for 10, 20, 50 years because it's great opportunities for all these fighters. And it's, it's, it's a brilliant time to be a European MMA fighter because you know as well, right? Let's say someone does go to PFL route, someone does go to Bellator route. It does open up the Cage Warriors route to get to the UFC then, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's opening up routes all over the place. Now, that does make a, maybe a more disjointed fight, uh, disjointed fight sport, and maybe gives us less of the fights we wanted. Like, everyone always wanted Paddy Pimblett versus Brendan Lachnan in this area, and now we're, you know, we're not getting it at the moment. Maybe we get it sometime stage down the line, but that, look that's something we're just going to have to live with. It's really something we're going to have to live with. But all in all, I think it's a great time for European MMA. And it's, it's, do you know what? It's like more money, more problems. <laughs> that, I think that's, that's what we it, have. Biggie Small said it best, didn't he? <laughs> he he did. said it best. He more did, money, more problems. And we always More get, organizations, <laughs> more problems. <laughs> we, we always get back to the notorious and we're talking about uh, European <laughs> MMA, don't we? So we'll, uh, we'll leave it there. Right. Thank you to everybody for listening. I really, really appreciate it. Um, you can follow Ian over on Twitter at Ionee. MMA check out his brilliant podcast The Old Triangle that's on uh, YouTube and it's on SoundCloud and everywhere you get your uh, your podcasts too and all these other brilliant podcasts as well I hear he's a lovely co-host and a few of the podcasts over in Severe MMA too so check all of his stuff out there Ian thank you very much for joining me thank you very much for uh, to everybody for listening my name is Sean Sheehan for SureDog.com and I'll see you all next time <laughs>